All right, thanks. I think we are recording now. Okay, so is alpha, a lot of these you're probably never gonna use, honestly, but so the, the ones I would wanna highlight would be is alpha just returns true if the argument is a letter, is digit just returns true if the argument is a digit. So obviously this one, um, I don't use it very often, but it's basically a combination of the first and third, right? If it's is alpha is true and is, or is digit is true, then is al noon would be true because that means return true if the argument is a letter or a digit. Um, is lower returns true if it's a lowercase letter. Here's is upper returns true if it's an uppercase letter. Is space returns true if it's a white space character. Is punct returns true if it's a punctuation mark. Um, and uh, those are basically the main ones. Any questions about any of those? You know, here's an example of where you might use one. Um, yep. We got is alpha, if is alpha, if is digit, if is lower, if is upper, if is space, and so on. Any questions about how you might use one of those? Uh, good question, Joseph. Um, you missed that. Oh, right here, okay. So yeah, good point. In order to get those functions, you're gonna have to pound sign include the CC type header file, all right? All right, no, no, that's a good point. Um, interestingly, I just wanna say a little bit about this. Um, it's not uncommon that you, you may forget to pound sign include this at the top and your program might work anyway. That is because there's a lot of, um, I guess what I would call cross pound sign including, right? So it's probably, or not probably, it's not unlikely that the um, IO stream library may already include the CC type library, which would mean that you might actually use these functions without explicitly having a pound sign include CC type file uh, line in your code. That's okay, but um, the best practice would always be to go ahead and pound sign include that anyway just because um, they may be different on a different system, right? Your, your pound sign include IO stream file on some systems that might pound sign include the CC type automatically in other systems, it may not. It's not a standard C++ issue. So anytime you use any of these functions, best practice is to pound sign include CC type even if it, your program seems to work when you don't do that. All right, any questions about that? Okay, uh, let's see. Nothing new there. I think we just want to go on to the next section. And basically those functions, you know, you don't need to memorize all of those functions. You just need to know that 
they exist. And so if you come across a situation where you think you might need one, you can you know where to go, look it up and find out if, if there's something that exists that will help you in your uh, whatever your current um, problem is. All right, so there's another category of character functions, character case conversion functions. And there's just two more functions here. Not a huge thing. I, we just talked about, I think like about eight different um, character functions. They all returned something of type bool. And actually there's just, one more thing I want to talk about with those that I forgot about. Hold on real quick. So this is just a little technicality, but, um, you know, it probably won't ever affect you, but you should know this just in case something comes up where it does. These functions are inherited from C, right? So technically speaking, if you just wanted your program to work, Instead of saying pound sign includes CC type, you could say pound sign includes C type dot H. And that would be saying, don't include the C++ version of the header file, include the C version of the header file. Okay, that's just, you, you know, you don't really need to know that. That's just a little trivia so that you know, um, the difference and uh, in C++, if you're programming in C++ and you ever find yourself typing pound sign includes something dot H, you should know something's wrong. Well, sorry, I should rephrase that. Um, if you ever find yourself typing pound sign include something dot H that is a system file, that's wrong because you would be pound sign including the C version of that header file. And you should instead pound, and pound sign include the C++ version, which would be uh, the same thing, except without the dot H and with a C in it. Okay. Um, so uh, because these are inherited from C, what's really happening here behind the scenes is that it's not returning true. What it's returning is a non-zero number because in C, there is no true and false. In C, we always just had to use zero for false, something non-zero for true, okay? But, we're not programming in C, we're programming in C++. So if you're programming in C++, what you should do with these functions is you should just assume or pretend, I guess, that what's being returned is true or false and that will have the same effect, okay? So just a little sort of behind the scenes uh, the, uh, picture of, uh, of what's going on. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's see what we got here. All Okay, so what we have here is two more functions that operate on characters. The difference here is that these don't return a, a bool value. They return a character. Two upper returns the uppercase equivalent of its argument. Two lower returns the lowercase equivalent of its argument. Um, 
that's pretty straightforward. There's a couple of little caveats here. Um, if you call two upper and the argument is not a lowercase letter, then what gets returned is just whatever the argument was unchanged, okay? Um, here's another interesting little tidbit. Um, let's see, close your eyes for a sec here. Okay, so a couple of interesting things here. As it turns out, again, these functions are inherited from the C programming language, which basically tends to mean that they're a little primitive or raw. Let's actually execute this function, compile it and execute this program and see what happens. So if I say compile, So unlike what it says in the textbook somewhere, uh, pretty sure there's an example of that somewhere, but here we go. Right here, our letter equals A, C out two lower, and, and what comes out is a lowercase a. What actually happens when we run it is we get the number 65. Anyone want to take a shot at why we might get the number 65 instead of what we were expecting here? Right, exactly. So What's happening here is instead of getting the uppercase A, we're actually getting the ASCII code of uppercase A. So what's going on here is that because this is um, a carryover from the C programming language, what this function returns is actually an int and it's the ASCII code of the uppercase equivalent of that argument. So in order to get the actual character, uppercase A, we would need to convert it from an int into a character. Okay. Any questions about what just happened there? Okay. Um, all right, I think we're ready to go back to the text. Um, uh, there's an example using two upper and two lower. I'm not gonna spend time going over it in detail. Just go ahead and make sure that you um, take a few minutes to go over this on your own in the chapter of the textbook. And uh, we're gonna go on to the next section of the text, unless there are any questions.
Okay, so um, you can kind of break down this chapter of the textbook into three parts. The first part is about characters. So we're done with that. We basically, the part about characters was just introducing you to several different functions that you can use to operate on characters. And those functions are in the header file C, C type. Okay, so that was, that was the first part. Now we're going on to the second part, which is talking about C strings, okay? So as a little background information, and I actually really like this summary in the textbook. So a string is just a generic term that describes any sequence of characters, right? Um, this is true in any programming language. It's not a programming language specific term. It's just a computer science term. A string is a sequence of characters, okay? It turns out that in C++, there are two different ways to store strings. You can either store them as, whoops, string objects. And I'm pretty sure we've talked about that a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. Or you can store them as C strings. Okay, the difference is C strings, they're based, they, they come from the C programming language and they are super primitive, raw, basically no extra features, just like the most basic possible way you could think of to implement strings. Um, the only reason that C++ still has them, two reasons. One is because they're from the C programming language and everything in C++ is backward compatible to the C programming language. But secondly, um, well, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe there's three, three reasons. Well, secondly, um, there may be times when you are programming in C++ and you're in a situation where every bit of memory counts and or every billionth of a second counts and C strings are gonna be just ever so slightly more efficient than using the string class, okay? Um, and so I guess the third reason why C++ still includes C strings is that prior to 1998, which that was what, 23 years ago now, um, there was no such thing as the string class in C++ even, and everything was in C string. So if you see some very old C++ code, you might see these, okay? So several reasons why C strings are still around in C++, even though really most of the time, 99% of the time, just using the string class and forgetting about C strings will be the best way to go, okay? However, we are, in this class, we're not okay with you being, uh, being okay 99% of the time, right? We want you to learn all of the primitive raw details. And so we're actually gonna spend a significant amount of time working on C strings. All right, so here we go. A C string is a string whose characters are stored in consecutive memory locations followed by a null character. So down here, this picture that I had just highlighted, there is the C string Bailey stored in memory. It's just an array, right? We've studied arrays in some detail now. We know about regular old fashioned 
non-dynamic arrays, and we know about dynamic arrays. Whichever one you want to use is fine for C strings, as long as there is a null character at the end, you're good, right? And the null character is there because that's how the C++ compiler is going to know that that's where the C string ends. That backslash zero is called the null character. And um, it's, it, it, it's just another character. You put single quotes around it, like, right? Like um, we did the same thing with backslash n, right? If you want uh, the new line character in C++, you put backslash n inside single quotes. Here we have the null character. If you want the null character in C++, you put backslash zero in single quotes. All right, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Okay, this is important. Without the null character at the end of the C string, C++ doesn't have any way of knowing where the end of the C string is. That's the only way that C++ knows how to tell where there's gonna be, where the C string stops. Okay. Um, so the, the point here in this section says more about string literals, but basically the point is that in C++, when you have a string literal, like if you say, see out, have a nice day, or if you have a string variable and you say, string variable gets, quote, have a nice day, unquote, that is considered to be, by the compiler, to be a C string, not a string object, okay? So we, we talked about how, you know, if, uh, if your, C++ program encounters the number 47, it considers that to be a, an int literal. If it, can, if it encounters something like 47.6, it considers that to be a double literal. If it encounters something in single quotes, it considers that to be a char literal, right? So this is just talking about the same thing for strings. And in C++, if the compiler encounters something in double quotes, it, can, it considers that to be a C string literal. The key point there being, it's not seeing that as a string class literal, it is seeing it as a C string literal. So, Uh, I think that's pretty much it, actually. C strings are stored in arrays. I think we, we, uh, we pretty much um, went over that. Um, any other questions about any of this? I think we pretty much got it covered. I know there's a lot going on here. Don't stress out if like, you know, I'm scrolling too fast and you can't see everything. I hope that you will have time to go back and look over this in, in, um, in some more detail. Um, but I think you have the basic idea behind C strings. Anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, OK. Sorry, there's actually something here that I um, I wanted to go over and I missed. Um, so let's look at this code right here. This is creating a variable called name. Name is an array of characters. 
So an array of characters is something that might store a, a, a C string, but it has to have a, um, a null character in there somewhere, right? A backslash zero character in there somewhere. If I have a, if I have an array of characters, but the array of characters does not have a null character in it somewhere, then that can't be a C string because if I try to use it as a C string, there would be no way to know where the end of the C string was. Okay, but basically if the idea is that if you declare an array of characters that could typically be used as a C string. Okay, so then I'm gonna say CN name and that'll work fine. In fact, the extraction operator works in this case. Normally you can't use the extraction operator if the right operand is an array, right? If I have an array of ints and I tried to say CN name, I'd get a syntax error. The only time you can use an array on the right side of the extraction operator is if the thing on the right side of the extraction operator is an array of char, okay? But here's the deal. If I type, if the user types in a name that is 20 characters or less, then there's no problem. It reads in that string, puts it into the variable name, and then automatically puts a backslash zero at the end so that the compiler will know where the C string ended. The problem here is what if the user types in something that is 24 characters? What happens in that case? As usual in C++, there's no range checking. So what's gonna happen is I'm actually going to um, overflow the array. I'm gonna be basically writing data into parts of memory that have not been allocated, okay? So this is bad. You never wanna do this. You always want to have some way to prevent the input from overflowing the boundary of the array. So the way we can do that is with the get line function. All right, so we're gonna talk about get line for a minute. Basically, get line is a function, here's a function call, and it does the same thing that using the extraction operator does. But with the extraction operator, there's no way to limit how many characters you're going to read. With the get line function, one of the differences between get line and the extraction operator is that you have this second argument size. And what that means is don't read more than this many characters into the variable, okay? So the cn.getLine function means read from the cn object. Whoa, I don't know what this happened. All right, read from the cn object, put whatever you read, put it into this variable here, line, but, only read this many characters. When you get to that many characters, just stop reading, okay? Any questions about the get line function? All right, so I'm going to tell you, uh, so that was one difference between using the extraction operator 
and using the get line function. Okay, with the get line function, you get to place a limit on how many characters are read. The second difference though, and I actually think this is probably a more, more uh, significant difference. And I'm just gonna tell you right now that what I'm talking about, the reason that I'm talking about it with such emphasis is that this is gonna come up in an assignment in a couple of weeks. And probably about 80% of you are going to forget about this, have an error in your code and spend five hours trying to figure out why your code's not working, okay? So please burn this into your brain. I don't know what, you know, whatever it is you do, write it down on a post-it and, and uh, put it on your computer screen or whatever. This is, this is gonna save you time if you get this right, okay? The second difference between using the extraction operator to read a C string and using the get line function to read a C string is that when you use the extraction operator, it always reads up until it gets to the first white space character, right? So if, if you're reading a bunch of characters into the variable name and then you hit a space, that means stop, I'm done. Or, or if you hit a tab, that means stop, I'm done. Or if you hit a new line character, that means stop, I'm done. Okay. That is different from the get line function because the get line function reads up until it gets to a new line character. It doesn't care about spaces or tabs or anything like that. It's going to ignore those. It's going to keep reading until it gets to a new line character. Okay. Anybody want me to say more about that? Anybody lost? Because that's that's gonna be like super, super important about three assignments from now. All right. Um, I will say one more thing about the get line function. You can actually provide one more argument for the get line function. So I can say something like um, cn.getLine line size. I could say something like this. Okay. So in the text, he doesn't talk about this this third possible argument, optional. But basically what that means is that is the delimiting character. So if I leave this out and I only have two arguments, that means read up until you get to the next new line character. So read up until you get to a backslash n character. If I provide another argument, that means Never mind about the new line character, read up until you get to the next, whatever that character is. So in this case, read up until you get to the next um, colon character. Any questions about that? All right. So that was basically our discussion about um, introduction to C strings. The next section in the textbook kind of goes back to the pattern of the first couple of sections. And it says, okay, here is a list of functions that you can use with this new thing we just talked about. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now 
is I'm basically just going to go through a bunch of um, functions that you can use on C string variables. Just to give you a little bit of a sneak preview, we're actually going to talk about four of them that are super, super important that you're actually going to have to use in your programming sometime in the next two or three weeks. And then there's going to be, um, I think, three where I'm going to say, this is not super important. Just make sure that you know where this is in case you have to look it up sometime. We won't use it in any programming in this class, but it could possibly show up on a multiple choice exam at some point. Okay. So first, first function, Sterlin. That just tells you how many characters there are in a C string. So for example, Here's an example. I've got a C string named name. I'm setting it equal to Thomas Edison. If I say length gets Sterling name, that's going to be equal to however many characters there are in that C string. And just in case you're wondering, this is a question that always comes up, that does not include the null terminator, right? So hopefully that'll kind of make sense. I mean, I, in an ideal world, I wouldn't even have to say that, right? Because looking at this code, I have a C string that is equal to Thomas Edison. Looking at this code, I should not have to be bothered with how that C string is being implemented. I should just be able to call the Sterling function and that should tell me how many characters are in that C string, regardless of how it's being implemented, right? So clearly the number of characters in that C string would be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, okay? Does not include the null, the null terminator because the null terminator is not part of the C string. It's just having to do with the implementation that is used to store that C string. Okay, so anyway, off my soapbox, um, whether you understand the rationale behind that or not, the main point here is that the Sterling function returns the number of characters in the C string, not including the null character. Any questions about Sterling? Okay. Stir cat function. Cat. I'm not sure if you have heard this term before, but cat is, is the abbreviation for concatenation. And concatenation in computer programming just means combining two strings together to make one, okay? So when I say stir cat, string one, string two, that just means make it so that string one is now equal to the concatenation of, or the combination of string one plus string two, okay? So pretty much if you understand this example here, that explains it all, right? I'm, I have a car, I have a C string. Whoa, sorry about that. Let's try that again. I have a C string named string one that is equal to hello. I have a C string named String two, that is equal to world. When I call stir cat with string one and string two, that means make string one equal to string one plus string two.
Okay. So I'm going to answer that. Uh, yes, it's only limited to two strings. So if you wanted to combine two, uh, like three or more strings, you would just have to do that with a sequence of stir cat function calls. But actually, Joseph's question is really important. And that is, well, so in one sense, the question is, when you're going to append to a string, and in this case, we're talking about C strings in particular, not just strings in general. And, and to be really technical just for a second, there's no such thing as append with C strings. We are um, concatenating, we're calling stir cat, right? When we call a star cat on a C string, well, do we have to give it a fixed size? Well, the answer is all arrays in C++ always have a fixed size. So yes, there's gonna have to be a fixed size. And the reason I said that was a good question is because that's really the super, super important point of what we need to focus on in this example. Notice here that I didn't just say string one empty brackets gets hello like I did here, right? What would be the problem if I just left out the word size from this one? Yeah, exactly. If I just left out the word size here, then I would have a string one would be of size. Actually, you're not quite right. If I just left out the word size here, the, the array string one would be, would have seven elements in it because the compiler would automatically make room for the H E L L O space, and then a null character. Okay, so then when I said, and I'm, I'm gonna just beat this to death because this is really one of the most common errors that students can't seem to get right in, in, in this class. So this is super, super, super important. Um, when I said stir cat string one, string two, string one would be of size seven. And I'd be trying to put a string, a C string of size 13 in there. C++ would not complain. C++ would say, okay, that sounds fine. Let's just go ahead and see how that goes. But you would be overflowing the size of string one because the concatenation of string one and string two would be too big to fit into the memory that has been allocated for string one. And that would almost certainly result in some sort of an error, probably just your program crash, right? So super, super important when you are dealing with C strings, and especially when you're dealing with stir cat, you have to make sure that the first argument has been allocated to be big enough to store the result of this function call, okay? That's probably the most important sentence I've said today. So let me just say it again. If you forget everything else from today, this is it right here. When you call stir cat in a situation like this, it's imperative that you make sure, right? So every time you, you're writing code and you find yourself writing a stir cat function, before you put that function call in there, you need to make sure 
that that first argument has been allocated enough memory so that it can store the result of that concatenation. Anyone want to ask a question about that? Okay, so let me just say a couple other random things about StorCat. Um, in general, uh, people are probably going to tell you StorCat is bad. You should not use it. Um, because it's very, you have to be very, very careful to make sure you don't do something unsafe. That's true. In general, in the real world, unless you're in a situation where um, you're forced to use StirCat because the code that you're working on is already using it, um, either that or you're in a situation where uh, you know, every billionth of a second counts or every bit of memory counts. You probably should not be using stircat. You should be using, you should not be using C strings at all. You should be using the string class instead. Okay. But for our purposes, we want you to be able to understand what's going on behind the scenes, what you need to do in a situation where every billionth of a second or every bit counts. And so you're going to become experts on C strings and you're gonna be using the stir cat function. Um, everyone okay with that? I mean, not, not is that, does everyone agree with that, but does everyone understand that? Okay. Um, so as it turns out, if you are using Visual Studio, Visual Studio by default is not even going to let you use StirCat. It's going to say that's not allowed. It's too dangerous. So hopefully you are all the type of people who like to live on the edge a little bit. But what we're going to do is when I give you an assignment that requires you to use the StirCat function, I'm going to give you the secret code to put in your program so that Visual Studio will allow you to use StirCat. Okay. Any other questions about StirCat? Okay. Turns out there's one more function that's very similar. Same thing with Visual Studio not letting us do it. Uh, dangerous how does it just cause crashes? Yes, that's correct. Um, although I suppose. Theoretically, there might be some. Uh, no, no, I'm just going to go with that. Yeah, it's just it's dangerous because if you don't do it right, you'll end up with code that uh, you know runs correctly the first ten thousand times you run it, and then the ten thousand first time you run it, it crashes the whole system. Okay, you just have to be very careful with it. And I certainly am not. I, I certainly don't argue with the 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 fact that you should avoid it if you can and just use the string class instead that's the point of the string class that makes things safer and simpler and more full featured um, but uh, we are going to just get to it and make sure that you can uh, use the stir cat function safely uh, um, so i guess the, the last thing i want to say before we end here is there is another function very similar to stircat. Same thing with uh, you know everybody thinking it's unsafe. Visual Studio will not let you use it. Um, very similar, except actually slightly simpler than stircat. In fact, stircat. Basically, the reason we have stircat is that in C plus plus you can't say. If you have a C string called if you have C strings called C star one and C star two, you can't say this. You cannot say this. C star one gets C star two, right? Or sorry, plus equals C star two. That's basically what the stir cat function does, right? 
And with any other type in C++, you could just use the plus equals operator, but you cannot use the plus equals operator with C strings. And so you have to use uh, stir cat instead. Okay. The next function that we would talk about if we have time, and we'll, we'll finish it up on Wednesday, but um, would be not only that, but you can't even use the assignment operator with C strings. You cannot say C star one gets C star two. Instead of using the assignment operator, you're going to have to say C star, uh, sorry, ooh, uh, star copy C star one, C star two. And that basically does what we what we would normally do with the assignment operator. Okay, so we'll pick up on Wednesday talking a little more about stir copy and kind of wrapping up this chapter and moving on to the next one. Um, anybody have any last minute questions before we're done today? All right, I'll see you on Wednesday. We'll finish up talking about characters and strings and we'll hopefully get a little bit into the next topic, which is structs. <laughs>